to Geared for Growth. I'm your host, Mike Mortlock. Today, we are talking about the great city of Sydney. It's the big daddy when it comes to median house prices, has been for some time, and my next guest contends that it will be likely in the future. He's observed some trends that we've talked about on the show in Brisbane, and that's the disparity between house prices in units in some of these blue chip locations. So we unpack what that means and where the opportunities for investors might be. He also talks to us about a trend that he's seeing where investors are buying properties with the idea of having a rental property available for their children. There's a lot to unpack in this episode and thankfully I'm joined by the lovely Chris Clark who helps us to unpack the lay of the land for Sydney and where he sees the trends and, of course, the opportunities for investors. So here's Chris Clark from Clark Buyers Agents. Chris Clark, thanks for joining me on Geared for Growth. Thank you, Mike. You've got a gushing fanboy over here, more from the property trio side of things, but very keen to be on here today as well. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, this you're right. This show is rubbish, but we do some great work at the property trio. Um, now, what's interesting is that uh, you kind of, I, I know, have been a great supporter of the property trio, which I'm a, a co-host of. Uh, but you commented on something that we actually discussed in a podcast interview with your brother Simon, who's mm-hmm. a buyer's agent in Brisbane. Now, you're a buyer's agent in Sydney, working mostly owner rock, but doing some investor work as well but you uh, obviously listened to that show and observed that what Simon's seeing on the ground in terms of a disparity between median house prices for units and houses in similar suburbs is really actually broad and there's an opportunity for investors you're seeing that happening in Sydney as well so I want to start by unpacking that what are you seeing on the ground yeah, it's, for me, it's very advantageous to have Simon based up in Brisbane. I'm here in Sydney. We both speak probably two or three times a week. So when he was going through his notes, part of it was me sharing mine and, as you said, then go into the data within Sydney. So looking at, particularly looking at suburbs, more the blue chip suburbs where there's a very high median house price, where are we seeing the median price of units going up? And is that there for an opportunity for you know, owner Ock, but particularly the investor side of things? What well, do you think it is... I'll go on. Sorry, Chris. No, after you. Well, I was just going to say there's a point of, I think we've all can see the unit price is going up because rent is going up. Yes. So there's a very vanilla, easy thing to say, well, it's all going up because the price of the properties are going up because the rental yield is going up. But there is some spikes in some key suburbs that indicate to me for the next year or two they could continue to be attractive. Mm, okay. Well, I'm interested in... Let's say that the houses in some of these blue chip suburbs, I mean, compared to the units, they're, they're you know, almost unaffordable to the average investor, right? Yep. What, what do you think the presence of these, you know, hugely expensive houses in these blue chip suburbs does to that suburb in general? Does it kind of drive the demand of people wanting to live in that area because it's the exclusive place that has five, 10, 20 million dollar homes? Is it is it the presence of the money of those people that's kind of driving the gentrification? Is it school zones? Like what is it that makes those suburbs areas that people want to live and can get in at a unit price? Yeah, uh, a lot to unpack there. I think not so much people looking for suburbs where there's the you know, 10, 15, 20 million dollar houses for sale, but I think it's all the all the spiral impacts that that then has, as you touched on there, the gentrification, you know, schooling, you know, is obviously typically uh, improved, let's say, with with backing of money from, you know, if mm-hmm. people are pay, paying for those properties, they're going to be more invested in the schooling itself. Um, and I think then you just go into the suburbs there is where they are. You know, they're not ones that have been historically, um, or at least not for a long time, been sort of manufacturing-based areas. They've always been residential areas, nice leafy streets. So it's not really a surprise per se, but I think yeah. we just allow that house price to go up so significantly that people looking to get into those suburbs are going, well, I can't afford that. But mm-hmm. I want to be there. I don't want to be three suburbs over somewhere that's in a house, but it makes me feel uncomfortable. Maybe it's a safety issue as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the units, you know, two-bedroom, three-bedroom, even a one-bedroom unit allows them to get in. 
Yeah. And of course, you know, they say buy land because they're not making any more of it. And there's only a, a certain amount of these houses in, in these pockets of, of Sydney, of course, that have been well established. Do you, do you think that the unit prices are being dragged up by the performance of these houses and that, that scarcity? Yes. Yeah. I think definitely the, as that increase in the property, the house prices have gone up. You know, it's, it's, as you said, you can't build more land. And if you're looking to get in Sydney, there's other places you could buy, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, God, you could buy anywhere across the world if you wanted to. But for those who want to get into Sydney, you know, at that price point, let's say 700000 to even, you know, high ones, more often than not, which sounds scary, but more often than not, an apartment's going to allow you to do it. So then what are you going to choose? Well, okay, I don't have my own land, but I want to choose the location. I want to choose the school zones, which is natural human behaviour. Mm. And give us a bit of a description of the types of apartments that we're talking about. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of always kind of thinking apartment is high rise, 400 units, one bedroom apartments. Now, those things don't exist in these blue chip suburbs. And I would assume that there's something that you would much, much more be inclined to call as investment grade stock than the high rise stuff that we typically think of when we think apartments. Yeah, overall, I'll put an asterisk on it. I'll come back to that in a second. But overall, yeah, what I'm talking about is typically like a red brick, you know, complex. It's got between six to up to 20 units in it um, quite commonly doesn't have lifts um, I really want to make sure sounds silly but I may turn silly to you on any listers but I want to make sure there's an internal laundry quite often these properties are so old they've got like a shared laundry for everyone to go to and I think that'll mm. always hold back the price because owner occupiers you know, naturally mums mums or dads don't want to be walking down the hallway with their laundry back and forth and sharing something um, so typically that red brick, you know, you still got a bit of land though, so it might have, you know, both a car park but also some grassy areas. Now, when I said put an asterisk on it, you've got to look at where the opportunities are. Like those things, those properties themselves are going up. If not, they've already gone up. You know, so there's also an element of looking at properties that have been, complexes have been built last five, ten years. You know, there's been some ones that have been, uh, you know, some poor cladding. There's, there's ones with mm -hmm. lots of issues. But the ones that have been built that are actually well done, you can go through the strata reports with a fine tooth comb and come out effectively squeaky clean, they're, they're the ones that I'm also seeing come in demand and I've got some confidence in, in recommending those options as well. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it does seem like there was a point in time where developers really – did seem to understand the demographic changes and instead of, you know, focusing on how much can we jam into this block because that's been a traditional developer mindset from a gross realisation point of view. They're like, no, well, people will actually pay a premium for these three-bedroom apartments in boutique complexes because, you know, let's say you've got the quintessential grandparents that want to have the grandkids stay over or they just want that extra level of space. You're seeing a premium for that type of stock as well? Yeah, definitely. I uh, purchased one just recently over in Botany, which was exactly that. as a effectively a grandmother. Um, she was initially looking at a one-bedroom uh, potential price range but then decided to get the second bedroom. In essence, the grandkids are on their way, let's say. They're not quite in the world yet, but mm. that element. And, you know, you're spending, you're still spending some money, so about $150,000, $200,000 more for that second bedroom. Um, that was comfortable for her, and I think it's probably worthwhile because as a as a resale, that capital growth, which is not something she's particularly interested in, she's yeah. like going to leave in a, in a cardboard box of some description is her plans. But <laughs> otherwise, um, you know, as an investment opportunity, two bedrooms, I'm confident in saying, are always going to be more attractive in a resale and capital growth standpoint than a one bedroom. Mm. Now, talk us through some of these suburbs because I guess they don't all match. You're going to have some that have a huge price differential and there's a good reason for it. You're going to have others where you actually see there's opportunity. How do you kind of look for those areas where you actually think this is where an apartment is going to really perform? First of all, start with data. You know, I know you're a lover of data. So start start with we, my team and I have done a full assessment and we regularly do re-look at the median prices of houses and apartments in the area. That only tells part of the story though because obviously it, it pulls all the houses that are one, two, three, four bedrooms and new and old together in a median price and it does the same with apartments. 
Mm. But we start with that and then we look at, okay, has that growth over the two or three months, has that, has that shrunk? So has that disparity shrunk or has it also grown? Equally, then that gets complicated, right? Because uh, some suburbs just have very few, almost no units. So there's not enough data there to really point it out mm. uh, or really come to something true. You have a look at various areas. So I look at Inner West as an example. You know, Haberfield to me st- stands out as probably the most significant disparity between the two. You know, it's almost, I think it's four to five times higher than the unit price to get into an, uh, um, for the house. Um, now, there's not a lot of units there, but they are there and they are going, they are increasing um, the, the value in terms of the price point. But I'll, we sit there as our team going, well, we, we believe the next one or two years, as a minimum, that's going to increase, and if not, even longer term than that. Mm. that um, I'll go on. That raises an interesting point about Sydney itself, because for a lot of the people that don't live in Sydney, don't understand the market. Often they sort of think, yeah, it's pretty, it's got the bridge and that that spiky opera place. Um, but I don't understand why the median house price is always so much more expensive than everywhere else. You know, you can look to places like Brisbane, you know, let's say five or six years ago where the, the, the differential was absolutely massive. It's, it's definitely closed a lot, but there's still a Sydney price premium. Now, you contend that that's unlikely to change anytime soon. What do you put that down to? The Give for Growth Property Investing Podcast is presented by our business, MCG Quantity Surveyors. If you're an investor or a property professional looking to get the best tax depreciation deductions for yourself or your clients, please get in touch with us at mcgqs.com.au. It's our mission to help as many property investors as we can to maximise their claims and maximise their property education as well. Part of it's my worldly experience. You know, I lived in Singapore for over four years. I've spent some time living in the UK as a younger man. And when you teach, speak to locals in those areas, and my team in Singapore at the time had about 25 people underneath me, 75%, if not 80% of them, their retirement plan was not only Australia, but more often than not, Sydney. Right. And this desire of Sydney, as you said, the Opera House, the, the bridge and so forth, the image it gives... Oh, you sit there going, Chris, you're a bit crazy because surely eventually at some point people globally are going to go, well, I just can't afford to get in there. Mm. But I think it's almost, it's that luxury brand. You know, you talk about yeah. luxury brands within automobiles, you look at the price of them, it's probably nowhere near the relevance of what they've actually, the, the, the mechanics of what they've put into it. But this uber feel of Sydney, oh, I have calls regularly from Sydney, Dubai, uh, sorry, Singapore, Dubai, Hong Kong, even from the UK, some of those are repatriations, but a lot of them haven't even lived in Australia before and their first point of call is Sydney. It's not a Perth, yeah. it's not a Brisbane, it's not a Melbourne, it's a Sydney. And I think there's all those elements there that give me some confidence in, in terms of saying that. And then mm. and from buying, yeah, as a buyer's agent here, we, we don't see anyone stopping. Like people who live in Sydney, yes, there's been some migration away, but... We're seeing those kids, 20 to 25-year-old, 30-year-olds, they're not looking at living somewhere else. They like Sydney, they want to stay in Sydney, and they're just going to deal with it and maybe ask mum and dad for a, a bit more of a loan. Mm. You know, it's it's interesting to observe the gold rush that's going on in Perth at the moment. In our data, we're seeing as you know, more than a third of all investors are piling into WA and that's a whole other show. But one of the things that I caution people is, you know, there was a period of 14 years where the median price did nothing. And there was also a period where the median price was higher than Sydney. And I think people forget that. Now, that was a real flash in the pan resource price gold rush style thing. But if you take that away, Sydney has been that perennial performer and I can remember in the lead up to Sydney having a million dollar median house price commentators saying it'll never go higher than me than a million dollars because people just psychologically can't get their head around it there was also conversations around you know the the income to asset price ratio will never go over 10 or 20 times but it continues to gallop along what is that all about the brand of Sydney? Is it about the fact that it's kind of constrained by the mountains and, and the beaches? Or is, is there something else at play about Sydney that just makes it that that little bit more expensive? 
I think the the extra you've added, you've said some really good points there. We're sort of land mass was sort of locked in, the, the, as I touched on the branding uh, standpoint. But I think also there's just cash buyers. I think that's the mm-hmm. frightening thing. Like I don't, I don't, I might be wrong, but I don't think the investors who are buying in Perth are cash buyers. I'd say no. the vast majority, not all of them, are getting out mortgages and you know the plan to buy. 10 properties in 10 years or whatever it might be they, they're, they're looking to dream up and go on with. Whereas Sydney, we lose at auctions and I've won at auctions with cash buyers. So there's no valuation. It's what the person thinks it's worth. If they're going to spend $4.5 million or $13 million, which I've done before with clients, and they've got the cash, there's no one stopping them from doing that. Um, it's frightening because then when they sell to buy again in Sydney, they've got the cash all over again. Mm. And whatever they've earned in between, or whatever that price is, the property's gone up for, to just continue on. It's like a rolling mall, just domino effect, but just keep going. It's frightening because logic says it's going to stop. I just can't yeah. see what actually happening. Lo- logic says that it at least has to have a ceiling somewhere, but it doesn't seem to happen. And that kind of is a reasonable segue into my next point, which is. Uh, you know, in and around the transfer of intergenerational wealth. And I think that's part of what's helping to keep this thing moving as well. But a trend that you're observing is that that buyers are wanting to purchase something with 100% the view of placing their kids in it as a tenant. When did you start observing this trend? Oh, it's, I'd say 18 months ago, maybe longer, but I probably... And that was after some bit of data that came through and, and having the same conversations, right? So I have conversations with people who are going to use my service and do use my service. And I've got conversations with people who have a discussion and they do it themselves or find another buyer's agent, whatever it might be. And just the volume of discussions there is really interesting on people looking to buy that property. And the, the really interesting part is uh, most of them aren't actually looking for the kids to move in tomorrow. Right, mm. there's this element of doing one gentleman at the moment. His kids are nine, seven, and five. You know, his plans are when they get to university stage. I've got other people when their kids are eleven and thirteen. This is a plan that's going to come forward in time. Um, and there's part of it they they also do say, look, maybe my kids won't ever live into it, but I like them to have the option. Worst case scenario, great investment that if I need to mm. sell and give the kids money, it's it sort of ticks both those boxes, and they they. The other really surprising part is they're all aware of the compromise, Mike. It's not mm. like they're saying, oh, this makes sense from an investment standpoint. I'll be doing this regardless. They they openly say, we know from an investment standpoint, this doesn't 100% make sense, but mm. it gives us peace of mind when our head hits a pillow that we're giving a chance for our kids to live in Sydney, continue to be here um, in their adult life and probably also a little bit of self, um, self-reason self of getting the kids out of home at some point. Yeah. That's interesting because, like, I mean, I can remember on the property trio, which we referenced before, you know, we have these gold nuggets. And one of mine, a couple of episodes, was in and around people going, Oh, I'm buying this place as an investment because I want to live in it in 10 years. And I just basically said, don't pervert your, your, your two things together by trying to mash them mash them up right like if you want to buy a place there in 10 years like buy the best investment property you can in australia and then use the money to buy something there because the chances of it you know ticking both those boxes is not there but these people just they just don't care i I, I guess i'm a living proof of that when i was in singapore purchased property in roselle with an eye four or five years time later to move into it but it was going Mm. to be an investment property first it was a great investment property mike Fantastic mm. investment property. I, I brought it, purchased it sight unseen because of the way the market was moving. I flew in twice and missed out. Um, so when we eventually picked up the keys and had the you know tenants moving in, I quickly realised I'm a tall guy. It was about two or three inches in my from my head to the roof in some of the rooms. <laughs> right. Once we moved in, it was just purely uncomfortable. It was almost depressing. Mm. Um, you know, so I, I relay that to those people you're talking to when they're saying, "I'm like, this is my example." It was disastrous. It was, you know, depressing. Don't do it. And I know there's various ways, but think about it either as a pure investment or think about it moving in. Now, also mm. I'm saying, but I have clients saying they want, they want the kids to move in. It's a, it's a unique scenario to be in. Mm. Yeah, and I guess if they're financially in a position where they understand they might be making a compromise but they don't care, I mean, they can still, they can still tick the box of it being a good investment. It just might not be 
the absolute best if they t- talk about the whole of Australia and where the the options are. But do you think do you think it's an insight into their perhaps fear or prediction that house is going to houses are going to become more and more difficult for young people to get into that the the market will just kind of gallop away to the point where you know I think if you look at the OEC data we are in the top 10 certainly in terms of what you need to actually spend on your home costs or let's say your mortgage costs it's around about 100 120% of your salary is required to service the mortgage on that asset and then that's assuming you don't spend a cent of it and you need another 20% more i mean it does sort of seem like we are heading in that direction is that part of the motivation you think uh yes but i'd double down and say it's not something they think is happening or going to happen I think they're already thinking it's happened and they're, right. some of them are actually stretching themselves beyond a comfort level. They might be saying, we want to invest in property. If we didn't have the kids, we'd spend 500000 in Perth or Brisbane or Adelaide. But instead, we're going to spend $1 million in an apartment that's probably not going to have the same capital growth. It's going to stretch us a bit more, but we have to not just do it now. We should have done this two years ago. We should have done it four years ago. And they're pinching mm. themselves going, why at the age old thing, right? When... When's the best time to buy or when you're ready? Mm. So I think I think it's not coming, Mike, in their mindset. It's it's already paramount to them. Mm. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, an, that's an interesting one. Uh, and, and I guess what they're also battling with at the moment is we actually feel like we need to step in, we need to give our children a, he- a, head up, a heads up. But part of their kind of growth into adulthood was – you know, saving for a deposit and having a mortgage where they had very little to spend. And, you know, it's kind of character building. It makes you appreciate what you've built. They're also kind of wrestling with this idea, geez, we might have to give them something, but how do we make sure they don't turn into <laughs> into little brats? You know, is, is that, you know, can you see that as part of their kind of thought process as well? Definitely. I think they're just trying to live in the world of reality of what's possible. So it's great to teach kids lessons but if you if you think okay, if I teach them that lesson that they've got to save the deposit and get there, and it's going to take until they're in their thirties, maybe in their forties, well, that's that's a lesson that's probably going to really hurt them later on in life. So I, I see quite often. I mean, when I was buying a first property, guarantors, you know, having parents guarantors were quite reasonably common thing to still process, but reasonably common thing. I think we've then seen, I've seen the, the evolution. I'm sure you've seen too, when our parents not only been guarantors. But paying fifty percent, seventy percent, and giving the kids, you know, that that fifty or sixty, seventy percent of their deposit. Now we're seeing the next evolution. I've seen the next evolution where I have a handful of clients each year where the parents are actually paying my fee in, in on in addition to those things. Mm. You know, so you go on one hand, I agree with you. We're making it too easy. The kids aren't really working for it. But I think the parents are sitting at home going, I can't sleep, you know, unless they've got a property, and I can't see any time in the next ten years to fifteen years. Now they're in university and they've got to pay hex and everything back that they're going to do it. So the caught between reality and I think what you want to drive as a parent. Mm. Now, finish this up, if you wouldn't mind, Chris, with what can we learn as investors from these observations? You know, we talked about the differential between house prices and units in these blue chip areas. We talked about, you know, the juggernaut that is Sydney and, of course, the mindset of people wanting to help their children, even if they're only you know, five, seven, nine years old, but they're thinking to the future. How do you see that kind of shifting the investment sands that in, in a way that we can get ahead of as investors? But what, what comes to mind is probably simple, less about what we do right now in the market, but more about just simplifying things down. So I think with investors in particular, they have this one idea, whether that's I want my kids to move into it or I want rental yield or I want capital growth. By the time they come speak to me and probably by the time they're speaking to you, Mike, after the purchase, they've got convoluted jargon with tax appreciation and this and that, and they start regurgitating to you of all the reasons they did this or all the reasons they're trying to do it. And I think the best advice I can give to anybody, and I have it quite often, is just know that one goal. What was the original intention of that investment property and stick true to that. Everything else is a plus and addition, but don't, 
we can get swept up as financial planners, as property strategists, buyers, agents, you know, we're all out there giving different pieces of advice. And I think if people, I see quite often investors getting confused by the time they're actually ready to buy, that they're trying to tick too many boxes. And so they end up potentially getting a compromise on what was their original number one goal. Mm. I love that. I think that's really, really good advice. And, you know, often the best advice is quite simple. And that's sort of, you know, that's a good way to describe that. It's so much noise out there. But if you just, if you focus on, well, what are we actually trying to achieve? And then everything else is kind of subservient to that. You can't go wrong, right? No, the age old kiss. Keep it simple. Stupid. (laughs) I love that. And what a way to finish. Chris, thanks very much for sharing your wisdom today. That was awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me along. Appreciate it. Cheers.